I am really deep into the excitement about all of this and I need to share it with someone. I gotta talk about it with someone. And it looks like it's gonna be you. You wanna talk about books with me? Let's talk about food books. Let's talk about food. We used to not care about cookbooks at all. They were stupid, boring wastes of space as far as I was concerned. I owned literally one cookbook that was a gift that rarely came out just if I was doing baking. Then I discovered a few years ago that food books, cookbooks, could be something more than a boring transmission of a recipe. I discovered cookbooks that had personal stories, that had cultural anecdotes in them, that had some sharing of the particular people's culture where they came from, and like maybe a bit about why their particular region was shaping their food culture in a particular way. For instance, they live on an island and their seasons tend to be somewhat harsh and so they have to do a lot of pickling to preserve the spring-summer bounty to get them through a harsher winter than another neighboring region. As a for instance, and it started to tie, so food had always been incredibly important to me. I, I love, you know, creating delicious things and getting to share those things and feeling that rush of creative success after you've made a really good thing, after you've invented something new. But once I discovered this kind of layer of food cultures within food, the world of food became so much richer for me and I've I've become a student, a student of it. If you're also kind of a food nerd, this might be for you. It's just one uh, small stack of books I'm gonna talk about and I'm gonna try not to go too in depth on each one, but give an overview and then a few examples of you know, recipes that I found um, extra exciting to give you an idea of why these are the ones uh, that I have to talk about with someone that I have to share. There was a whole other stack of books that came from the library or uh, borrowed and they weren't as interesting. So this is the cream of the crop. I hope you enjoy. So the first book I want to talk about is called Salt, Sugar, Smoke, How to Preserve Fruit, Vegetables, Meat, and Fish by Diana Henry. And here's a cover. It's just like, what a beautiful picture she's got there. And all of the pictures in this book are gorgeous, just lovely and simple. And I'll actually take some pictures and uh, put them up here so you can see, because it's an important part of the book. So pretty, aren't they? Like, so pretty. It's one of the first books I came across that revealed to me food cookbooks could be interesting. The reason with her is partly the personal stories scattered throughout. It's not every recipe, but she has a description of a trip she took in Europe and she had found out about this bed and breakfast in, I want to say it was in France, that had a cupboard with like 150 different kinds of jam. She planned part of her trip around going out of her way to that bed and breakfast so that she could see and taste like all the amazing jams that they made. Just like that's the level to which she's excited about home preserved fruit. She talks about it being sort of a time capsule and sunshine in a bottle. And you can tell 
from how she writes. This is really how she thinks about jam. And that's one example. Her entire book is not about jam. It's just really one of my favorite examples. She's got some cultural uh, information she shares about some of the recipe inspirations, one of which was... So in Germany, it's known as a rumtopf, but she prefers the French name. It's called a confiture de vie garçon, and my apologies for the pronunciation, but the translation is basically preservation by a middle-aged single man. So like, this is such an easy method for preserving fruit that even men without wives can do it. And like, she delights in the name and you get to know a little bit about that place and you get to know about it and I love that. She was the first person to describe to me a method for smoking food in your home. It's just one of those flavors I crave. So it's been enormous for me to be able to do that in my apartment without bothering the neighbors. Several of the recipes, you're only going to get an extra couple weeks of refrigerator life out of them. All of it isn't, you know, gonna go in a can in the cupboard and be good three years later. Though there are lots of recipes that are more shelf seller stable. She has an entire chapter on chutneys, relishes, and pickles, and all of her chutneys look really good. I'd like to try her Christmas chutney next year. She's got a salted, cured, and potted chapter, which is for all of you carnivores looking for something to do with fish or mm, whatever. Uh, syrups, alcohol, fruits and spoon sweets, and the spoon sweets are just like these delectable little tiny sweet special treats. Uh, she's got a whole chapter on smoked, and I've already covered how that's exciting. She's got a chapter on under oil preservation, sauces, paste, mustards, and vinegars, jellies, curds, and fruit paste, and then the jam chapter. So it pretty much has everything you could be looking for, but like especially just sitting back, looking at a bunch of pictures and daydreaming about food. It's a great one, I recommend it. In the winter, there's a month or three where I go through my seed catalogs and this year it was extra because it was 2020. Adaptive seeds is my favorite. There's a lot we could talk about with gardening and preservation techniques. And one place I like to start preservation books, and I use them this year to help me think about my garden. Think about what I want to plant and how much of those things I want to harvest once they're in season and how I want to preserve them, what flavors I want to bring out, what uh, ways I want to use them new combinations I might want to try, and knowing that helps me decide how much I'm gonna plant and what and what seeds I need to order and which plants I'm gonna wait and order plants instead of seeds. I mean, first, if you're looking for something that has a broad range of knowledge to share, it's gonna give it to you concisely. It's gonna provide some recipes. It's gonna give you enough information to start playing with those recipes as suits your tastes and abundant quantities. Then preserving everything. Can, culture, pickle, freeze, ferment, dehydrate, salt, smoke, and store fruits, vegetables, meat, milk, and more by Lita Meredith is a great one. This is not full of lovely personal stories and cultural tidbits from uh, places across the globe. There is an intro where the author talks about her own 
personal love of preserving foods and how that's sh been a shaping interest passion of hers for decades. But once you get into the body of the book, it is essentially a manual with some very tasty looking recipes and helpful charts that uh, tell you how to water bath can if you're at high altitudes or the fruits that have higher quantities of pectin or lower quantities of pectin. Important to know if you're doing jellies and jams. A list of fruits and vegetables that will cellar more easily, so they'll store for a long time in a cool dry place. This book doesn't have the sort of rich personal and cultural stories I usually go for. So why am I recommending it? Well, because it is so excellent at doing its job of just being a manual of how-to, and I use it to build my own gardening and preserving practices, and I am part of, shaped by many of my own cultures. So just because a book doesn't have stories about what other people are doing in their cultures doesn't mean that you can't use the knowledge to further your own personal cultural practices. And that's part of why I really enjoyed preserving everything. Two books that I own and love and use yearly as part of my garden planning practice, both before I plant anything and I'm daydreaming about what I want to make with the garden, and also as I'm harvesting things and I'm trying to think about what to do with you know, the garden made extra radishes. I just didn't think it was going to make as many as it did. What am I going to do with these that's different this year? So the first one is fermented vegetables, creative recipes for fermenting 64 vegetables and herbs in krauts, kimchi, brined pickles, chutneys, relishes, and pastes by Kristen K. Shockey and Christopher Shockey. Fiery ferments. 70 stimulating recipes for hot sauces, spicy chutneys, kimchi with kick, and other blazing fermented condiments. Also by Kristen K. Shockey and Christopher Shockey. They have been teaching and practicing fermentation for many years. They sell their goods at farmers markets. They also travel the country teaching classes and have traveled internationally to learn and share knowledge about fermentation and traditional food practices. So they have those kinds of personal stories, but because they also have been traveling and talking to like-minded folks for so long, they know a ton of the people that are in the fermentation community. And they uh, have several pages with little bios about particular fermenters in Austin, you know, in New York, who are practicing specific techniques. Maybe they're making uh, specific pickles that are traditional to their Jewish heritage. Maybe they bought a farm and they unexpectedly had tons of extra produce so they started making uh, some ferments and also started selling it at the farmer's market in their area. But it's, I think, generous and humble of them to acknowledge these other fermenters, their other stories and practices, and that it's not something that they created. It's not something they innovated. It's a global practice that different humans in different places have done over time, and each culture has its own preferred flavors to come out of fermentation, but everyone has done it, and I love that they acknowledge that. A couple of the recipes that we use extra frequently are coffee sauce recipe. Uh, it's kind of just a fermented hot sauce with a small amount of coffee beans, which is like honestly one of the best recipes we've ever come across. We've done herbed paste, I think is the title. We call them bouillon because we are taking some of the fresh spring and summer 
herbs that don't freeze or dry well. So especially your basil, combining them with other herbs and strongly densed flavors, garlic, adding salt, and you got homegrown, homemade bouillon in an assortment of flavors. Uh, we've done chutney section for inspiration and ideas on some of our own chutneys last year. Did a whole experimentation with tomatillo chutneys. There's not a specific recipe in here, but they gave me the methods for making ferments and different chutneys and taught me enough that I was able to use that to make my own things. They've got some, uh, you know, horseradish, beet kvass type drinking beverages. There's all sorts of goodies, but if you like planning your gardens while thinking about what you're gonna do with your bounty, but you want a little more story to your, to your food books than it to be just a manual, I would recommend these highly. Next book I want to share with you is called Preserving Wild Foods, A Modern Forager's Recipes for Curing, Canning, Smoking, Pickling by Matthew Weingarten and Raquel Pelzel. And there's the cover, which unfortunately the barcode is covering. On this one, I want to actually read just a little bit from the introduction. When I'm in my kitchen in New York City, I think of our microsystems here in the Northeast. I plan menus mindful of the season with dishes inspired by the ebb and flow of urban surroundings, woodland, meadow, and seacoast. For example, when I find a plump early spring brook trout, I think about how to serve it. I envision myself standing knee deep in ripples of water with my fishing rod and satchel. I imagine what surrounds me. Maybe cattails and fiddlehead ferns. And then I begin to picture the dish. Fire grilled trout, gently pickled cattails, and butter sauteed fiddleheads. Like the saying, what grows together goes together. There's a natural rhythm to the pairings. Fish from a bro brook served with greens and other plants that grow streamside makes sense on a plate and it makes sense on the planet. I ha hope to capture this feeling in these pages, which is why I organize chapters according to natural environment, freshwater, saltwater, field, forest, and cultivated garden. Each setting offers a new journey. Through old-fashioned storytelling, a little history and lore, some cold hard facts about preserving and curing, and my passion for these traditional folk ways, I hope you're enticed to go out in the world, pick something, and put it in your cupboard. Enjoy not just the taste, but also the memory of its discovery. Like what a perfect summary of his approach to preserving and foraging. He is fairly, you know, wide in his span of what he covers for preservation techniques. There are some that last quite a long time. There are some that are shorter, uh, like the uh, salt sugar smoke book. He has a recipe for making garum, which if you don't know garum, you haven't been watching Tasting History on YouTube, and you should. Uh, he has information on harvesting wild fennel pollen and then some recipes for using that. He has a whole little description of a preserve that they make in Eastern Europe called lekvar. Lekvar apparently is made when an entire village brings their harvest of plums to the town center, stone the plums, throw them whole in the pot like an enormous cauldron, take turns throughout an entire day stirring the cauldron, uh, Slowly, the plums begin to break down, the uh, moisture evaporates a bit, so the flavors are condensed, and the plums are transformed, and like, there's so much history and culture and love and community in that whole idea. There are several highly productive plum trees in my neighborhood. 
I'm thinking this year, like, what if we can organize some kind of miniature Lekvar party? That would be amazing. He has a black walnut chutney recipe uh, that I'm definitely going to try and catch the walnuts at the right moment this year to try and make this, and a black walnut liqueur, a recipe for pickled fiddlehead ferns. They're really easy to identify, so if you're new to foraging, you can pick them and feel safe. His description of them uh, pickled and how they stay crunchy and they absorb pickling juice so that it gives them sparkle and sets off the flavors makes sense. I'd like to try that sometime. And I just also really appreciate how he organizes the chapters in those regions where you would find the food. He is clearly excited about the pairings of each item from one place when possible so that you can go back home and have a meal that reminds you, that transports you kind of literally back to that place. And I think it's a really special way of approaching foraging and preserving. Recommend it. I recommend all of them. That's why I'm doing this, but recommend. Okay, we made it all the way through this video. Uh, not the entire stack of books. I uh, was either very over ambitious in how many books I was going to get to in one video, or I had too many things I was interested in saying about each book to describe why I think it's really interesting. Possibly both. Uh, but it's, it's great. It's perfect because I just split them in two and this one, I tried to keep it more cooking, preservation, better wild crafting with some thoughts about gardening practices and preservation. The other one is more sort of a global cultural gathering. I hope you enjoyed this one. Please give me that like if you made it all the way to the end here hit that subscribe because I'm going to talk about uh, other food books. If you're into that kind of nerdery on occasion, we're going to talk about those and some of the recipes that are more interesting. I'm also going to get in the kitchen and do some experiments. I'll probably take you foraging with me, both uh, urban foraging and out in the forest, some wild crafting. And I'm sure we'll do some gardening, garden planning, actual gardening, harvesting, preservation, so pretty much everything related to food, food science, food nerdery, food cultures, local, global. I'm interested in it all. I hope you are too. Thanks for watching. This is the first one that I think is good enough to upload and share, so I hope you agree. Thanks.